So hello everybody, my name is Anne-Sophie and today I'm going to tell you about how Esperanto isn't the solution or uh, how is, uh, or why uh, collaboration is not about having a single language. So first of all, let me introduce myself. Um, I work for Dataiku, which is a vendor of an end-to-end -end software platform uh, for advanced analytics and predictive applications. And before that, I used to be an opera singer. So let me tell you today a little bit about what I experienced in the field first. Doesn't seem to work. Now it does. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about what happens when a project starts. All the stakeholders meet at D-Day. They have prepared their work separately on their side. And they come together and they have exactly three weeks to make it happen. So um, they, you've got the director uh, who's uh, worried about his concept. You've got the soprano who's worried about her voice. You've got the state manager who's worried about the technical feasibility of it all. You've got the opera director who actually wants to fill his room with happy audiences. And you've got the conductor who's worried about the music because in the end, that's what it all, it's all about, right? So, actually, they all have different priorities and a very different vision and also different objectives. So, as the schedule gets tighter and the tension grows, it starts looking more like that. However, sometimes it does work and the magic happens. But why is it only sometimes? Why is it not always? because I'm actually ta ta talking about highly skilled and talented people here. So the problem is not about the lack of competences. And I'm going to tell you a little story. I actually saw a great project in opera fail miserably with a highly talented crew. It was an opera project in one of the leading opera houses in the world, with a crew of five very famous and capable artists. So, what happened? Well, among the stakeholders, you had the conductor, and he had a very analytical view, and very academic view, too. So, he wanted to be in line with tradition, basically. It was, of course, very relevant and right. The only thing is, he took over the project and imposed his vision of the score on everyone else. Uh, the problem is that the stage director, on the other hand, came from a completely different universe. She was a very talented and respected theatre person, but she had very little clue about music. So, as time passed, she felt more and more uncomfortable and insecure in this universe, where she felt completely out of the depths, and she also saw the whole project was escaping her. On the other way, uh, you had one of the leading singers. And the conductor found that her consonants were not clear enough, so he was actually very insisting on that. And she wouldn't get it right. Then she was, a very, she was not intellectual or analytical at all. She was quite spontaneous and very music-driven. So interesting fact is that someday the conductor was ill and he was replaced by his assistant. And this assistant never said one thing about consonants. He was just focusing on the character, making her work. And guess what? At the end of the day, all the consonants were in place. So from this experience, I understood two things. Force everyone to fit in a restricted environment despite their skills just doesn't work. First of all, because it's an ego problem, because to perform is not the same as to implement. And the stakeholder of a project bring along their competences, their vision, their experience. And if you deny that to them, well, they feel less implicated in the project and they start feeling uncomfortable with it. And you'll end up impoverishing the project instead of making it more interesting. Second thought is, the quality of a framework in a project is at least as important as the technical abilities of its stakeholders. Now, imagine a project where every stakeholder has the ability to express himself in his way in a given framework. That starts to look like a 
project that might be successful. So don't worry. I'm not an idealist, I'm not a hippie, and this is not about everyone living in a happy community. It's just that I think that, of course, every project needs a leader, and of course, someone has to carry the bigger picture in every project. But it is not about raising one voice above all others and silencing all the others. I like to think of a project as a whole, composed of many interwoven skills and not an addition of different competencies. So now imagine my surprise when I first arrived to Dataiku and I saw that all our clients were actually facing exactly the same issues. Because what I just told you in reality is not at all about opera. It is about everyday life in most companies. So what was the first use case I was confronted with when I came to Dataiku? Well, it was a big insurance company, so that was our client, and he was facing the following problem. They wanted to build a data lab, so to be able to centralize data and do some data-driven projects. For instance, they were working on sensor data in the field of telematics to make elaborated and targeted offers to their clients. They also were also working on appetence scores, and they were working on digital go-to-market. So they needed basically to clean their data and prepare it, to do some quick prototyping to test the project, and then to scale them into production. Well, let's look at the team that we had. We had an in-house data scientist who was uh, working, used to work in SAS and was uh, training himself to work in R, to do some models in R. Uh, you had uh, two newly hire, uh, hired data engineers. They were working mostly in a Python environment, and they were um, actually, their job was to translate the models that were created by the first data scientists to be able then to deploy them in, into production. You had a team of analysts. They were actually, they came from the pricing department, so they, were, they had very strong analytical skills, but they were quite new to the project. Then you had a first project leader who was, who had, was the guy with the technological vision, and you had a second project leader who was actually worried about the budget because he was the one who, to justify the budget, so his main focus was actually to deploy uh, as many prototypes as possible into production. And you had also a big team of external stakeholders, which were consultants. The problem with these consultants is that they used to come and go constantly. So we had, at some point, they, were, they had uh, a project going on about, um, um, they were doing some uh, appetence score, and uh, they had a consultant inside, Mathieu, who was doing the models. Um, he did the proof of concept, and then the project was left aside, and they would come back to it two months later. In the meantime, all the stakeholders would work on different projects, and Mathieu was actually staffed in another project on another company. Two months later, when they validated the, the proof of concept and they decided to deploy it into production, well, Mathieu wasn't there anymore, so they got Jeremy instead. And um, the thing is, uh, alone to understand and update themselves with, Matt, with the work of Mathieu took them three weeks. So it was not a very smooth workflow, as you see, and it was very time-consuming um, to, to be able to assemble all the bricks of the chain in this workflow. And the result was that it was complex and it took a long time to deploy prototypes into production in this lab. So, do you remember the soprano and the conductor and the director I was telling you about before? Well, here they are all again. The score has changed, but the stakes basically remain exactly the same. I was quite surprised. <laughs> uh, so, the question in the lab was, how can you make everyone work together as a team, giving every stakeholder the ability to get on with their goals and, at the same time, the possibility to improvise? Because at first view, improvisation and collaboration are almost contradictory, right? How can you make a whole team work together on the same project and, at the same time, let everyone work in their own way? We all remember, I guess, the Tower of Babel, right? Trouble came when everybody started to speak in a different language. And the problem with bad memories is that they stick, tend to stick around for quite a long time. And since then, it seems that we always believed that um, 
we can only build something together if we speak a single language. We think of a project basically as a box in which everyone needs to fit. Just pull them all in and cut the edges. Well, my belief is don't cut the edges, because that's what makes a project interesting. Plus, I think that's also what makes it work. So imagine this box as a flexible framework, which shape is evolving depending on the different people who are in it. As long as people stay within the borders, they can move and shape their own way, basically. Just like when you're packing for holidays, stop thinking and being worried about how is all this going to fit in there, instead ask what kind of container would be most adapted to be able to gather all these kind of very different items. So, let the environment adapt to the content and not the contrary. Because I believe that is how you're going to make the most of your team. So again, question, how do you make all these people work together on the same project, speaking a single language? I mean, you could hardly think to retrain every, your, your entire team to learn code. I mean, uh, this would be very time consuming, uh, very energy consuming, costing a lot of money, and in the end you would still have 50% of people who feel very uncomfortable with it. Uh, you could say, okay, let's have a code-free solution, but then um, you'd have uh, very frustrated uh, data scientists and developers who won't perceive their added value anymore in the project and who feel like left aside. Um, so, let me rephrase the question. How do you make all these people work together on the same project, speaking all these different languages? Or in other words, having all these different competences? Because I think that is where the real challenge lies. I told you before that the true challenge of a project a leader was in defining a flexible and relevant framework. Well, what is a successful framework then? What I think is there are three key points to a successful framework. The first one is that it should be collaborative and that we should allow everyone to prototype easily at its own level. So imagine an environment where everyone can actually work in his way and optimize his competences. It should be an environment that would allow all these different languages to actually coexist and that would give every stakeholder the ability to prototype using their own skills. So either by developing some code or by clicking. In other words, you want to have everybody equally implicated on the project. And equally doesn't mean in the same way. It means according to everyone's competences. Second key factor is um, I think that uh, in a framework, the project leader should be able to have a global view about what happens in real time. I'm sure you're all familiar with the lonely developer syndrome. This syndrome is about the developer developing his models on his laptop, in his corner, on his favor in his favorite coding language. Well, the problem is, how do you make the link with what he has done and the rest of the team who might be coding in a different language or not coding at all? How do you deploy these models into production? And how does a project manager keep an eye on everything when he doesn't even have access to part of the project? So the thing is, the more different separated bricks you will have in the chain, the more difficulties you will experience to supervise them all, right? Wouldn't it be a relief if there would be a single platform where, as a project leader, you'd be able to be on the same page with every single stakeholder, knowing what has been done before, what is been doing right now, and what needs to be done in the future? So a supervision, literally. It's not only about being on the top of your mountains and looking everything from far, but it's also being in the middle of what's going on, so supervision in two words. Uh, while it is happening. So therefore, a single place and a leader in the middle of it all at the core of the project. Third factor, uh, a successful framework, I think, is also a framework that goes from 
one end to another of the flow in an agile environment. So ideally, you don't want to be separating the different units in your workflow. On one end, you've got the raw data that comes in, then you have the scientific team working on it, on this data and extracting its value, and finally, at the end of the scope, you've got the operations who deploy the project into production. So there are several reasons why you'd want that. I mean, I'm sure you probably all have experienced the fact that many projects don't go across the R&D phase. So they all stay in shelves once the prototypes have been done. Partly because it doesn't take the same skills to create prototypes, and on the other end, to link them to business cases and scale. So at the end of the framework, uh, uh, so an end-to-end -end framework, sorry, allows you to actually fluidify and smooth the processes and simplify the passage from one step to another. Also, everyone has a specific field of competence in a project. Ideally, you want to connect all these fields of competences together because it also allows skills improvement. I mean, if you create a workflow where everybody complements themselves and they share their know-how and experience, you have also an iterative process going on. So the aim is to be able to have a smooth workflow that allows you to scale quickly. So these are just a few thoughts that I wanted to share with you. Because even before uh, we start to talk about skills, IT infrastructure, algorithms, etc., we should step back a little and ask ourselves, how is everyone going to be working together on this? And in which environment are we going to de develop this? I don't know if everybody's familiar with Esperanto, that was my title before. It's a language that has been uh, made uh, 50 or 70 years ago. Uh, and uh, it's uh, supposed to be a global European language. Um, well, you see, I'm sure it was really interesting to build this Esperanto. But I'm also pretty sure that we won't be speaking it in the next future. I mean, it's a pity, I'm sure. I love the idea. But then, it's only an idea, right? So thank you. <laughs>